All right, what's up, y'all? Thanks for coming out. Welcome to all of our locations, our campuses. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jared. Uh, thank, just want to thank you for being here. We're in a series called Foundations where we are looking through the Sermon on the Mount, which we've been in the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus for quite a while now, and we're picking it back up in the fall as well. So come back for that. Either way, we're watching what Jesus is teaching verse by verse by verse at a time, section by section by section. And as we read the Word of God, we let the Word of God read us. And we're on a, a, a really uh, powerful truth today that will sound familiar to most, if not all of us, and how God is calling for our lives to foundationally be a part of this truth and live this truth out. So let me pray and we'll dig in. Lord, thank you again for all gathered. And I pray over our time that you would open our hearts to the scriptures, open the scriptures to our hearts. Help us to discern your voice, to discern your truth more than the voices and the messages of culture that lead us astray. So I pray you would speak to us today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. J.C. Penney. Anybody familiar with J.C. Penney? Is that still a thing? Are they still around? I'm not even sure. I meant to Google it and I forgot. Uh, so J.C. Penney, if you're under 40, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but... <laughs> It's a retail store. I, we, I grew up in a little small town called Clanton, Alabama growing up, and my mom would always take us for our school shopping and Easter shopping in Birmingham, and I remember J.C. Penney going to J.C. Penney. J.C. Penney, believe it or not, before it became J.C. Penney, was the Golden Rule store. And then eventually it went from the Golden Rule store or stores to J.C. Penney. And I wondered why, why did he... Call, call them the golden rule stores. Well, I guess it's because he was saying for his employees, we want to treat our customers the way in which we want it to be treated. What a way of life. But I think sometimes if you're like me, you tend to take the golden rule and make it kind of a slogan, kind of a, I'd ag I agree with it and I should do it more. But do we hold it as the teaching of Jesus and the life he's commanded us to live Almost in the sense that you could take the golden rule and all the commandments and even what he taught in the Sermon on the Mount, and it become the pinnacle of the Christian life, the behavior, the way of life as a Christian. I think we might see that unfold here today. So what is the golden rule exactly? Here's the way Jesus put it, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Let me read it again. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So Matt, Matt, automatically I'm thinking, come on, Verizon. Can you take this to heart for us? But then again, imagine your family. Imagine if your family, beginning with you, beginning with me, approached our marriages, our children, our parents, into the workplace, into the neighborhood, into the communities, if we approached our lives with this commandment from Jesus, this call to do that whatever you wish what, what others would do to you, do also to them. Now, there are variations of this commandment out there. I was stunned this week to learn there's actually an iron rule, there's a bronze rule, there's a silver rule, and then we get to the golden rule. So here's the iron rule. By the way, don't, don't raise your hand in any of this if this is not you, all right? But here's the first iron rule. Here is the iron rule. Do unto others before they do unto you. Amen or uh-oh. The bronze rule. Do unto others as they have done to you. Then there's the silver rule. And this one gets close. That's why it's called the silver rule before the golden rule. And this silver rule was actually taught by a rabbi named Hillel before Jesus even came on the scene. And here was the silver rule. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. That's close. And that's, a, that, that's pretty tight in terms of the way to live. But there's, no, there's really no sacrifice to it. There's no initiative or proactive way of living. If you look at it, don't do unto others what you don't want to do to them. That just says be nice. You can just be nice to people and not have a relationship with them. You can just smile and keep going with really no life in it. And that's not what Jesus calls us to do. It's not 
don't do unto others what you wouldn't want them to do to you, but whatever you wish, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do unto them. That is the call. Now, there are other variations as well of this. Well, I say variations, other thoughts about it. Some think keeping the golden rule is salvation. So over the years, I've heard people say, you know, I keep most of the commandments. In other words, they're saying because I keep most of the commandments, therefore I will go to heaven. I've also heard some people say, I just live my life according to the golden rule and then God is good with me and I'll go to heaven. But then I would say for any of us who would think that way, I would say, if you kept the receipts on how many times you didn't keep the golden rule, oh, it shows you and I, we need a savior and the golden rule ain't it. And neither are ourselves. We need Christ the Lord to save us. Also, it's not just a way of salvation. It's meant not to be hypocritical as well. In other words, the golden rule should keep you and I from putting people or holding people to standards that we would never hold ourselves to. So, for example, you might say, gosh, they're just so touchy. And you're not. Or they're just so opinionated. And you and on and on we could go, putting standards on others that we don't apply in many ways to ourselves. And then there's the way of seeking to understand the golden rule as something you do situationally, momentary, but not as a way of life. That can also be an issue. Also in the sense that it can be momentary that it depends on the person you're dealing with whether or not you'll apply the golden rule. I mean, if they, if they push your buttons and they have some sense of triggering you in any kind of way, well, they don't count, but we don't see uh, Jesus let us wiggle out of this. And more than just it being situational to apply the golden rule, and that is how you can apply it as well, I see the way Jesus talked about it and all the scriptures talk about it as being the character of a disciple of Christ. It is the atmosphere you walk into the room with. It's the atmosphere you carry with you at the dinner table or at the workplace. There's this golden rule way of life in which you view others and in which you and I would do life. So, for example, if you want respect, you give respect. If you want encouragement, then you'll give encouragement, whether they give you an encouragement or not, whether they respect you or not. The call is the golden rule. And to find our identity in Christ first, and that free us then to be this way. Also, to apply the golden rule to your life and mine, especially what Jesus says here, wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Well, we need to know ourselves and what, what we would wish for, to do, for others to do to us so that we might do so to them. What I mean by that is to know yourself in such a way that you can answer questions like this. What is it that really encourages me? What is it that pleases me? What is it that fills my cup? And you lead in that atmosphere. You lead with that way of life and in terms of situations of how you could put that in play or even another way you could do it. You could ask, what really upsets me? What rubs me the wrong way? What triggers me? What brings out the worst in me? And now that you begin to understand about that, about that uh, yourself, now you bring that into other situations that you don't want to be that kind of person. You want to bring a di different atmosphere. You want to be kind. You don't want to be a difficult person. You don't want to be a person who creates problems. You don't want to be a person where people have to walk on eggshells around you. And that can happen as you apply this, take in and apply this golden rule to your life and mine. So I say it's character. I say it's an atmosphere, but also you can use it in situations as well. So this Swiss army knife, check this thing out, this Swiss army knife. I know I wore a dark shirt. I spilled coffee on my white shirt this morning, y'all. I don't even know why I'm telling you that, but there it is. And well, you can't see the, the dark here, but it's a, it's a Swiss, army, Swiss army knife. Maybe you can see it a little bit better if I hold it against here. So a Swiss army knife here. And think of it, a Swiss army knife, you can do a whole lot with a Swiss army knife. I mean, there's, there's whatever that is. There's a, there's a fingernail file. There's a little saw. There's uh, a can opener. So you can use a Swiss army knife and apply it to many situations. That's the golden rule. The golden rule is like a Swiss army knife 
in which you can apply in different situations, especially simple situations you may find yourself stuck in. So do you find yourself stuck in an issue, not, not a relationship you're stuck in, but an issue in a relationship that you're stuck in? Do you have something, a situation right now, and you just don't know the right thing to do? You just don't know what to do about it? Apply the golden rule and see how that approach might break some things loose. Still, though, I would say, overall, Jesus is carrying it or sharing with us it is a, again, the atmosphere of our lives, the character, a way of doing life. And here's how we see it in different places in Scripture. I had so many texts. I'm just going to give you a couple. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's a way of life, but it, but it can also be in a situation. Philippians 2, 3, and 4, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. So that's a way of life. That's being a disciple of Christ, but it's also a Swiss army knife. Then Matthew chapter 5, which we're going to get to in the fall, Jesus says stuff like this. If you get smacked on one cheek, turn to give them the other. Now, he's not talking about abusiveness here. He's just talking about a way of life and doing life. Also, if someone sues you for your cloak, Jesus says, give them your shirt too. If someone forces you, a centurion of that day forces you to go a mile, go two miles. If someone asks to borrow something from you, always let them borrow it, to which I think of, oh, even if they're going to break it, even if they ne might never give it back, Jesus would say, yes. Whew. Now, I hear that, and if you're wired like me, he lost me at getting smacked on the cheek because I know what my first response, and it's looking at his cheek. You know what I'm saying? So here's what Jesus is leading us to do, and I go, well, this sounds foolish. After all, aren't I to love myself first? Aren't I, aren't I to think of myself first? And what about being a doormat? Sounds like this is just me laying myself down and let people walk all over me. The Apostle Paul approaches this in one way when he talks about how we can be in situations and go through things where we want vengeance, we want our, we want our way, we want to put people in, our, in their place. And the Apostle Paul takes on that context about vengeance and revenge and put people in their place and not being a doormat. And here's what he says. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. But then I go, but, but Jesus said to do to others what you wish they would do to you. And I don't want burning coals on my head. So what is he talking about here? Well, if you go to Proverbs chapter 12, this is where Paul is quoting from. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. And if you look at the rest of the Proverbs chapter 12, here's the practical side of it. He's saying when you live out the golden rule, if you're mistreated for it, the principle is most likely to maybe, it's not a promise, it will dump shame on their head for treating you in such a way. It will make them uncomfortable because as we, the way we put it, you kill them with kindness. So that's what he's getting at. So not a doormat, it's just leaving it to the Lord, seeking to honor Christ and do what the Lord says here and then trusting him with the outcome. So let's return here to the great, the, the great, the uh, golden rule. Matthew 7, 12. <clears throat> so whatever you wish that others would do to you, <clears throat> do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's key. So do unto others what you wish they would do to you, and this is the law and the prophets. So let me, let me ask you, when you hear the words, the law and the prophets, what do you think of? Well, I'll tell you what I immediately think of. Kill joy, religion, suppressive, on, on and on I could go, rule keeping. So what is Jesus after here? This doesn't seem like much of a motivation to keep the golden rule. Well, we've got to trace out where Jesus is coming from. So if you go back to the Old Testament, specifically to everybody's favorite book, Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, you'll find this phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. Even in the Old Testament, God was showing us how to love and to love each other. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. So what did God mean first in the Old Testament with this law and prophet, this love your neighbor as yourself? How to apply it then? And then we'll get practical on how to apply it today. So here's one verse right here to help us. Deuteronomy 22.1. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. So let's go with that in terms of the day. So right here we see God say, thou shalt not, right? It is a command. You shall not do this. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them. So that's law prophet talk. That's command talk. So in other words, it's like the Pharisees of the day. They would look at the ox or sheep going astray and they would go, Oh, if I don't go get their ox and sheep and return it, I am in sin. I am in sin. I must go and return it because God said so. Okay. But Jesus took it further than that with the golden rule and with the great commandment, as we'll see more in a moment. He's saying now with the ox or sheep going astray, it's not, I better go do it or God will strike me down. I'll have the wrath of God at sin if I don't. Jesus says, no, no, no. It's not that you have to. Now you get to. This is something you get to do. And it's as if God has wired us. You don't even have to be a Christian. And there seems to be something fulfilling to go and help someone who, who are in need, the oxen sheep going astray, to go help them. But again, in our humanity, we tend, to, we tend to drift away from that. We tend to be too busy. We tend to be, well, they wouldn't do it for me, so I'm not doing it for them. And on and on I could go. But Jesus says you got to go further than that, further than law, get into the heart of this is a get to with the golden rule, not a have to. So let's get practical. So say you're out of town and, or your neighbor's out of town and they left the window down on their car and they're gone. They're, they're out of town. They can't swing home and do it. And you know that, or they don't, and they don't even know they left the window down, but you see it. Or maybe your neighbor's lawn is growing really high and you're thinking, well, they're just lazy. They need to get out and mow their lawn. Or maybe you're going through the neighborhood and you see your neighbor's dog running around the neighborhood and you think, oh, their dog got out. Good luck with that. I don't like dogs. Well, what do you do? So what happens is Jesus is saying, well, you love your neighbor with the golden rule. And you look at them in such a sense and go, if that was me, I would be sick at my stomach that I would have left my window down for a week and it rain and probably somebody come in there and steal my stuff or I'm off and, or I'm sick. And if I'm sick and I have no way of mowing my lawn and my family lives two States away and there's just no way I can get to it. What do I do? I'm stressed, making me more sick or my dog, my dog got away when I wasn't around, and that's, that's my dog. That's, you know, he's like a member of the family, and uh, he's running, and what's going to happen to him? Now, if he's a cat, you can let him go. Golden rule doesn't apply. <laughs> but it's your dog. But, so there's something in you that says, I, I, this would be a tremendous loss to me. I can't imagine what a tre tremendous loss it will be for them if that, ha if that happens. So I'm going to put the plastic over the window. I'm going to chase the dog down, though I don't like the dogs. I don't like the dog hair all over me and in my car. But I get to do this because I'm a follower of Jesus. I love my neighbor. That's what he's getting at. That's where Jesus is taking it. The apostle Paul, again, picks this up in Galatians 5 where he says you're free to do this. There's joy in this. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So he's saying, you're out from under the whole, you know, I better get the ox and sheep or God's going to strike me down in sin. No, he's saying, you've been freed from that. Christ has already taken that. Christ was already stricken down for you on the cross. And so through faith in his sacrifice on the cross, you are made right with God through his resurrection and free. Now it's about, not about being afraid. Now it's about I'm free to, to, not, to, to give up how busy I am for a bit or whatever I'm stressed out about for a while. And I get to do this outside of myself. I'm free to do it and not indulge myself to stay in a place that it's all about me. 
indulge my flesh. I thought about this. So a couple years ago, I was invited by someone to go speak at this event. And so I drove up and the, the host and myself, we traded our phone numbers where we could text each other. Something was happening on my end, travel problems. I could text him. If something was happening on his end, he could text me. So I do the thing. I'm headed back home. And as I'm headed home, there was a family issue unfolding in our family. So I pulled over and was trying to describe some things to Christy and kind of put it out there. And I hit send. And when I hit send, immediately I knew I had messed up. I sent it right to the host of the event. Anybody ever done this? And you feel like you would vomit, didn't you? Me too. And when I, I did it, I just threw my head back and I thought, oh boy. So I sent him another text and I said, listen, man, I just sent, as you see, I just sent you something pretty intimate and vulnerable about something our family's going through. And I'm sorry you had to see that. I'm embarrassed about it. He texted me back and he said, Jared, I saw in the first three words, this text was not from me. I didn't read it. I deleted it. Anybody ever want that done for you too? Not indulge the flesh? So in the same way, why wouldn't we do that as well? We all know we've sent the email to the wrong person. We all know we've sent the text to the wrong person. And so here's one way to apply the golden rule. Before you don't indulge the flesh, you delete it. That's what we would want. So for what that's worth, the apostle Paul then takes it again into this character, this atmosphere of living out this golden rule, way of life. Look at the way he puts it. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be. I love that. Whatever. It's like Paul forgot the commandments. It's like, and uh, forget it. I just, all, all the other commandments out there are summed up by this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And you go, well, of course, well, I hope you would go, of course I would do no harm to my neighbor. But also, but, but see, the golden rule means you and I could do harm to our neighbor by not helping our neighbor. We could do harm to our neighbor by not practicing the golden rule and so forth. So here we see Paul giving the law and the prophets, do not, do not, do not. But he says now it's a new day using Jesus' golden rule as a way of life atmosphere that it's not about the don'ts and the do's. It's about love. Love. Words like, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Striking. Love, love, love. So there, there comes my question. Where will you, where will I get the strength to love like this. Uh, man, man. All right, how about this? Imagine this week. I said, everybody, when you go out this week, love your enemy. Love them, love them. Do them good. No matter how they treat you, do them good. And by the way, while you're at it, think of others as better than yourself this week. Outdo everybody. Even if they don't show you honor, outdo them in showing honor. And if you get smacked on one cheek, give them the other. If they tell you they want the cloak, give them the shirt too. You're going to go out and do that this week, and you won't even come back to church next week. <laughs> and if you do come back to church, you're going to confront me in the hall, or maybe you'll send me an email instead and go, Pastor, I did everything you told me to do out of the Bible, and it was the absolute worst week of my entire life. Well, absolutely it would be the worst week of your entire life if you don't have the proper power to pull this off, if you don't have the proper strength to love in this way. So what is this kind of love? Is it law and profit? No, no. Law and profit gives us guidance in how to love and not harm, but that's not your power. It's not the strength in which to love in a certain kind of way. Oh, could it be this? Could it be as the messages are everywhere you turn outside these walls, I need to love myself. If I just love myself and I really love myself, then I can love like this. And I would just say, love yourself. How, how do you pull off 
How do you pull off thinking of others as better than yourself if you just really got to love yourself? How do you outdo others in showing honor if you just really need to love yourself more? How does that happen? It can't happen. In the Bible, God himself, Jesus himself, says the way you love like this is not by loving yourself. Here's how you do it. You ready? Let this set you free. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Don't love yourself with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And the, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The golden rule hangs on, that, on those two commandments, especially the first, the great, first and greatest, love the Lord your God. So notice the order of love here. The order of love is you love God first. This is the only way you will have cosmic strength to love in the ways we've seen already. To love the Lord God first also means that the golden rule is not a fortune cookie slogan. It's not a retail store slogan. It's, it's life. It's given by Christ. It's given by God through Christ in the New Testament, this golden rule. So there's the order of love, which is to love God first. Then there's the who to love, especially first. Who do you love? Not yourself. Not even your neighbor first. So let's talk about it again. If we approach anything with, I just need to love myself more, then you're in a place where you're looking at a relationship going, what am I going to get out of this? What am I going to get out of this? I wonder how many friendships have ended or stalled because somebody was saying, and we've all been there, me included, what am I getting out of this? How many marriages have stalled or ended because what am I getting out of this? So that can't be the answer. So Jesus shows us the answer. Love the Lord your God first with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And then the first and greatest commandment follows. Love, I'm sorry, that's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So even then, I got to tell you, I know, I know me in this way. I know I don't have it in me to love the Lord my God with all my heart. Anybody getting that right? With all my strength, with all my mind? Listen, give me about five minutes and I've dropped that already. So how do we do that? And then love my neighbor as myself, how do, you, how do you love a neighbor who doesn't even really like you as a neighbor? And I mean not your neighbor house to house. I mean, it could be. I mean, overall, people in your life, where are you going to get this from? You and I, and this was revolutionizing for my life and my preaching years ago. And it's to realize I don't even have that kind of love to love God, much less love people. And then God set me free. And I hope he does you with my favorite scripture of all. And it is this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and proved it by giving his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So he, it's, it's all about God. He's, it's all about him. He's the one who first loved you. He's the one who first pursued you. He's the one that called out to you. Believer in Christ Jesus, you were chosen and adopted by God. He loved you first. And if you just look over the track record of your life, that ought to humble you to your face, that he would love you first. And then in bringing that love into you, something begins, I pray today, begins to stir. And there's a, a love that he has for you that begins to grow, begins to break some things loose. And then through his love for you, you look back up and you say, and I love you. And God says, I love you. And you go, no, no, I love you. And God goes, oh, I love you. And it's this love. It's this love relationship. This is where it happens. This is the cosmic strength, this cosmic love outdo one another in showing honor. 
think of others better than myself, have no debt except the debt to love others. They asked me to go one mile, I'll take two. How do you do that? This. Him for you first melts, your, melts my icy heart, and then it melts and then overflows to love for him. And then as the bonus, it flows out to love your neighbor as yourself. It flows out into the golden rule. It flows out into the golden rule as the atmosphere of your life. It flows out into the golden rule as truth you can apply to situations and issues in your life, especially with people. Because of this final text that brings it all home, and it's 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. That revolutionized my life. That brought something into me that I don't and still don't have in me. It's all about him. And I pray that today you will know this and receive it for yourself. My mom was the chief prayer warrior over my life when I did not follow Christ. She was the chief influence over my life through all my days growing up. And the one thing I saw, I saw her read her Bible. She sang in the choir, godly. And also I would watch her just serve people. And even, even different times I would think, why, why does she, it always seems like she's not getting much in return from people. She just gives and serves and gives and serves. And one day I just said, mom, why do you do that all the time? And she said, Jared, I believe we were put on this earth to love and serve people. And so I've, I think about that a lot. And I was thinking about my mom through this whole message, preparing for the message, and she got it. Because I saw my mom as one who received the love, first love for the Lord. And then out of that, I saw a love for her, for him that overflowed. And then I saw this love pour out in practical ways through her life. See, my mom didn't love herself. She loved the Lord, her God. And that was her strength in which to love. So this week, let me ask you a question. What is a situation you're in right now? What's a tension you're in? What's an issue in a relationship that you're having? Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's with your kids, kids with your parents. Maybe it's with a friendship. I don't know. But it's been contentious and nothing is working to resolve it. What if you apply the golden rule? Have you tried that yet? Maybe approach it in such a way because the golden rule is a Swiss army knife with many applications. So maybe the golden rule might apply to your situation. Or how about this one? This week, how can you and will you live your life because you've been first loved by God and that has awakened and melted something to overflow in your love for him and to now understanding that it can overflow for you. So as you think of this visual, as you think of what God has done, how now this week can you live out the atmosphere of the golden rule? You live out the golden rule when you walk into the room or people walk into your space. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a welcome. It's a kindness. It's I'm safe. It's golden rule character. Apply that this week. I pray that God will show you. Amen. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for revealing that your love, you and your love is what it is all about. I praise you for your great love, the foundation of your love, the love to build our lives on. Praise you. Praise you. And Lord, with this teaching, I see I still have much room for growth. And I know I'm not alone, so I pray you would help our unbelief. Help our unbelief. Give us grace to build our lives on you, Jesus, to build our lives on your truth, to build our lives on your love, not on any messages out there that seem to make sense and we see they are not working, that your love is the answer. Give us divine enablement to build our lives on you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. amen.